Today's guest is from Australia. She is the founder of developingdiamonds.com.au. The website says that they are helping Muslim women to renew and rebuild their faith and identity. She has 12 years experience in teaching, 100 plus features, 1,000 plus students from her community, and 20 plus in engagements of speaking with the community. She's a teacher and a coach. Welcome, Kalisha Bennett. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Alaikum salam. Peace, peace be upon you as well. Thanks for nice, joining Nice us to be show. here. Okay. Yeah, alhamdulillah, nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation and uh, look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. So um, yeah, you can see on the screen, um, for those who are watching, it, watching this on YouTube, um, this is uh, Kalisha's website. So um, maybe Kalisha, can you just tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am a born Australian Muslim. Uh, my background is that my dad is a revert to Islam, Australian revert, and my mum is from the Cocos Islands. A lot of people say, where on earth is that? Um, basically, it's slightly under Indonesia. Um, and um, yeah, my parents met early on in life and uh, my dad was introduced to Islam through my mum and her family. And then, um, alhamdulillah, they, you know, my dad converted to Islam, uh, he, he himself was already on a journey for, uh, of seeking the truth and, and wanting to know um, who God was and have a deep understanding of who God was. And after looking in, into different religions, alhamdulillah, Islam uh, managed to answer all the questions that he'd had. So it was exactly what he was looking for. Um, and yeah, they journeyed on through life and um, raised us, you know, we grew up in um, uh, Western Australia with our families in, in a, you know, moderately, uh, you know, small, moderately practicing Muslim community. And, um, yeah, alhamdulillah, now I'm involved in a lot of different community work and I've always been quite passionate about, you know, uh, our Islamic identities, about Dawah work. I think coming a lot from my dad, seeing my dad's passion for Islam, I was always reading, my parents were always watching lectures and they were really uh, motivated in their Islamic learning journey. So that being modelled in front of me, um, it really impacted my own thirst and desire to understand Islam, to practice it as best I, as I could. But then also there was a, a deep drive to share that with others. So now, alhamdulillah, I've um, you know, spent most of my adult life uh, dedicated towards uh, teaching it to whoever I meet or whoever is in need of learning about the faith, whether Muslim or non-Muslim or uh, yeah, any, anyone from any background, basically. I established Developing Diamonds uh, to give focus on the strengthening the Islamic faith and identity of my Muslim sisters and young people. So, yeah, you know, I'm able to service Muslim women of different ages and backgrounds and even non-Muslim women sometimes who might want to know the basics of Islam. I have also taught, you know, free online um, intro to Islam um, sessions as well. So I mix the work up a bit with free paid one-on-one um, -on -one coaching workshops, courses. I take ladies away for retreats. Um, so I do a little bit of everything in whatever way I can reach the community and sisters to remind them about Allah SWT and about the beautiful uh, blessing that we have in this faith and its teachings. If I can just remind others about the beauty of that and call to that, then you know, I feel like I, I've lived a, a life worth living, inshallah. Yeah, that's great. That's excellent. So it looks like when I when I surf through it, it looks like it's sort of designed for uh, mainly for Muslims. Um, mm -hmm. How how will um, how would people who are um, non-Muslim who are interested about becoming Muslim, um, how will they yeah. benefit from this? Yeah. So I guess if someone just basically wanted to have a conversation with me to learn a little bit more about Islam, they just get in contact. Otherwise, some people might be like, you know, I'm, I've been learning about Islam, but I'm not sure yet. They might want to have coaching sessions with me to kind of um, help them to kind of process the way through their struggles with um, knowing whether Islam truly is for them and whether they're sure about, uh, you know, how ready they are to step into it or what might be holding them back. Because often, you know, I'll meet, I'll meet women who are like, you know, I, I love Islam, I love its teachings and I know I believe in it, but um, I don't know how my spouse will cope or my family will cope or my friends or my workplace. Um, so a lot of what I do in supporting the faith and identity is actually helping to improve women's confidence in themselves in terms of stepping into making their own decisions and having conviction in those decisions so that they can live their truth as opposed to living a life uh, where the focus is rather on making others happy 
and um, you know it's too common now where women will you know deny their own realities deny their own wishes and aspirations deny their own truths to please others around them and that's really unhealthy in the long term you lose yourself in that and um, I love the process of helping uh, women to kind of step into their own and make their own decisions and you know in Islam we, you know, Almighty God says that, you know, there is no compulsion in religion and truth stands out from falsehood. So just in that way, if a Muslim, uh, if a woman wasn't Muslim, she wanted to learn about the faith, I'm very much about just, well, here's what it is and, and this is your journey and I'm just here to support you in that journey. And, um, you know, the doors are always open to those who want out the faith. But my biggest thing as well in strengthening the, you know, the faith and identity is in the retention of of Muslims who do become Muslim or Muslims who do start to practice the fact that um, there's a you know there's a massive struggle with those who might convert to the faith or those who might start practicing the faith from previously not practicing and them being uh, consistent in that. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned um, about how you, you would help someone with their family coping. Um, so yeah. if this was a um, someone interested in becoming Muslim. And then they had to cope with this issue of how will mm. my family deal with it. So, um, what are sort of the things, some of the things that um, that a person yeah. who wants to become a Muslim what will have to deal with, and how should how would they deal with it? Yeah, well, there's massive diversity in the journey of someone reverting to Islam, and you know, I spent over more than a decade uh, working um, closely and supporting closely. Uh, revert convert sisters and a lot of them are still till now some of my closest friends and I think the biggest thing is there's no black and white journey when someone enters Islam and some of the the mistakes that I've seen in the journey is you know, they're ready to sacrifice everything for this newly found truth, truth and belief but then those supporting that person or those around that person based on whatever community they've entered Islam through whatever mosque or organization they've entered to Islam through if that community isn't trained in how to even advise or support this person often what they say is like now you believe in Allah you're now you're part of the ummah now this is you know we are your family we are the ones that you know that matter more and your Muslims are you know are closer to you your Muslim community is closer to you than your blood which of course these things are all true but then what happens is the person is then led to you know what, now I've got to totally disrupt down a mountain of Islamic literature and say, you all need to read this because if you don't, you're all damned to all fire kind of thing approach. Um, you know, there's so much diversity in the way that we're supposed to approach um, the journey of, of, a, of a revert or a convert person. It's very delicate so, and it's very unique. So because of that, it's, it's got to be case by case support. Uh, there needs to be a lot of wisdom in um, advising or supporting a person who might, you know, be saying, okay, my family's not going to take it very well or my family is totally open. Uh, there are so many different scenarios and issues can come up. So it is a very um, kind of push and pull, a uh, bit of a tightrope situation where there's no one set, uh, you know, path for any any person who enters to Islam. It's, it's going to be uh, you know, interesting. And, and if if, they, if someone goes through a very easy journey, an easy transition and their family is supportive, that, but it's not always the case. And the support needs to be there for that person in terms of helping them to navigate in a way that their family doesn't feel threatened, that their family still feels acknowledged, um, that their family doesn't feel like they're, you know, being rejected or turned away from. Um, so yeah, there's a lot we could kind of um, discuss in that in that area. Yeah, yeah. I think this is one of the big things that um, people sort of worry about is how will my parents, you know, respond? How will my friends respond? And even yeah. once they've become Muslim, what's happening now? People are, are um, acting differently around me or, or I'm acting differently around people. So the, the support that your um, website and your service could give would be a, a great option for someone who, who really needed that, that extra help. Yeah, definitely. That's, I guess I'm most passionate about um, holding space for my Muslim sisters or people who are looking into Islam, just for women in general. To, and, you know, what holding space means is um, that whatever it is they're going through, number one, I never will carry judgment. I'll never carry expectation. Um, and I'm uniquely there for them in that, that journey in a way that they need me. Um, you know, there's no agenda. There's no... Um, there's no, you know, burden of them feeling like they, you know, they aren't, they aren't good enough or that the struggle that they're in is so shameful. 
I think we have too much in this world and within our communities, too much judgment, too much pressure for people to be or act a certain way or to be at a certain level. And I think we, we lose a lot of sincerity when we're in those types of environments. So um, the way I like to, to teach, um, to support, is in a way that holds you wholly capable of navigating your journey. But sometimes you just need to lean on someone during that or to ask for a bit of advice or to ask someone to help you, you know, get access to some deeper knowledge about a certain topic. So, I, I, you know, I, I see myself as like a bridge. I just want to be that bridge for people who are seeking, sincerely seeking and searching and need support. They can, um, you know, utilise me as a bridge to get to where it is that they want to go um, in terms of having a better relationship with their creator and a better experience of being um, a faithful, um, dedicated and, and practising Muslim. Okay. And tell me about your private um, Facebook group and the coaching sessions. Can you tell me the difference between them and how, how someone will benefit from them? Yeah, so I have like a, a private Facebook group and I have a WhatsApp uh, group. That's for women who want to see some, uh, have some, you know, issues addressed a little bit more intimately. So they might, there might be common questions or themes coming in. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to create a video and I'm going to talk to the ladies and address this issue with them. So, um, you know, within the privacy of, of a WhatsApp group, a ladies only WhatsApp group or a ladies only uh, Facebook group, it's just got that little bit more um, element of intimacy with it because as we know these days you know sometimes videos can go viral and some of the issues that we address for Muslim women can be really sensitive um, and delicate so even the coaching one-on-one -on -one coaching or I have group coaching programs as well it's just about women being in whatever area or whatever stage or struggle of faithful practice that they're in to closely support them and mentor them towards achieving their personal unique goals of improvement and i think that's how we you know that's how we help people to empower themselves i don't give anybody empowerment and i'm not really keen on that word to be honest but i feel like we have the strength within us already and sometimes we just need support to be able to see that strength and bring it forward um, for us to really have conviction and, and confidence to practice or, or to implement what it is we really want to from our hearts um, so yeah, I, I just I, I like to just um, provide that that encouragement, or to be able to point out the potential and abilities that women have that maybe they're not seeing. Yeah, this um, the topic of uh, having good role models and you know uh, proper mentors and teachers is is very important, especially with your path to Islam, because there's a lot to learn. Um, yeah. Which which brings me on to the next point of your um, on the screen here. We can see it says the, on your website the free uh, to download the free ten step. 10 Steps to Strengthen Your Islamic Identity ebook. So I'd just like to go through some of those points now and maybe yep. you could um, relate them to someone who is um, interested in becoming Muslim. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the free PDF that you can get off your website. It's the 10 Steps to Strengthen Your Islamic Identity. So let's maybe take about uh, a minute or less for each one and just uh -huh. tell us how that a... Um, a person who is interested in becoming Muslim or a new Muslim, how were they? Um, how do these relate to that person? So number one is who are you? Yeah, yeah. So the first one, you know, probably a very important question when we're looking at the topic of identity to ask ourselves, like, who am I? Like, do we actually ask us? So to be able to understand who you are, you need to know where you've come from and why you're here. And ultimately, you know, within the Islamic tradition, we learn that we are here, we are created by God as a test and, you know, a test to see who is best in, you know, intentions, deeds and, and morality and to live a life where we are in service of God, that the, you know, the purpose of creation is nothing except to worship God through all that we do and all that we endeavor to do. So, you know, that journey of understanding, okay, I want to improve my identity. Well, who are you? If I said to you, who are you? How would you answer that question? A lot of people struggle with that. If, if I was to say, who are you, write it down in a couple of sentences, you probably need 10, 15 minutes to really think about it. But that's something we should know instantly. So it kind of just raises the question to lead into the set of tips that we have in the ebook. Okay. Okay. Actually, this is step number one. Study the Quran. Oh, it is step one. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So step one is to study the Quran. And that's uh, what I always, you know, in, in one of my signature programs called Own Your Identity. The, the way to know who you 
are is to find out who God says you are. And you find those answers in the Quran. A lot of the time when people are looking into Islam as their purpose, it feels like God's speaking to me. And it feels like I've found myself through what I'm reading in the Quran. Um, so it is the number one place to go with, with knowing who you are, uh, how you're supposed to live, what, what your potential is, what to avoid, what to be for in life. It's the ultimate instruction book to build you into the best possible human being you can be. Okay, great. And step number two, to work on your inside. Yeah. So step number two is to work on your inside. I put that tip to people think, okay, I need to improve my faith. I want to improve my identity. So then step one is to look more religious on the outside. And it's so, so important to make sure that you're doing the inner work, that you're checking um, in with your relationship with your creator, purifying your heart, repenting from sins, um, you know, establishing a greater connection with your Lord, you know, through deeper connection through your, your acts of worship that you do, that when you read the Quran, that you are connecting with the words that you're reading and internalizing it, that when you do pray or you do supplicate to God, that you are really uh, mindful and tuned in while you're doing that. So to give the inner uh, part of who you are focused before you start or whilst you're starting to work on the outer practice. Yeah, yeah, I think this is the inner, the inner aspects of Islam are the, truly the most important. And when from the outside, before you become a Muslim, you might look at Islam and you might think of all these things that you see from the outside, like all the prohibitions and all of these things yeah. that you might see. When, Regulations. Yeah, yeah, when actually the, the actual engine, the whole thing that's running it is what your heart is doing. And yeah, so, um, exactly. This, this is like, this is Islam, actually, the inside. Um, exactly we, we have to do the outside but um this is i think this is the most important part yeah starting on the inside because too often the damage that we see done in our communities is because those who outwardly look religious haven't done the inner work and 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 their state of heart is is not good or not healthy and they actually cause more harm than good but look religious on the outside yeah. um and sometimes even those who convert to the faith they, they get so much uh, instruction of this is what you need to do now. This is what you need to do now. Do, do, do all this external change. But the, the internal, that strength of connection of their heart with their creator hasn't been given the same due attention or the time to really uh, cultivate. So what happens is quite often with, with converts is there's convert like burnout after a couple of years. They just burn out because the inside hasn't evolved at the same pace or rate as the external um, practice. So, yeah, yeah. This is what I found when I first started um, practicing Islam: is that all of my inner um, characteristics changed. Things yeah. like um, getting angry, getting emotional, um, worrying. All of these things, um, when you can flow all your energy towards um, the good and your Creator and to God comes easier to um to control all of these inner um neg inner negative emotions yeah definitely so let's look at number step number three so we talked about the outside and then the next is the uh, sorry we talked about the inside the next is the outside yep so now is to work on the outside and of course you know a lot of people say my faith and practice is in my heart my sincerity is there that's what matters most so then they spend their lives not really doing a lot of outward worship it's very important to remember that if faith is truly in your heart then it will manifest through your actions and that just as much as our faith is growing within us and we are you know establishing you know a more sincere connection with the creator a purer heart uh, more purified intentions stronger morals it also needs to you know be shown externally as well in physical worship so just as the heart is worshiping the creator and devoted to the creator now the body needs to be in service and devotion to the creator and you do that through acts of worship and islam has you know a myriad of options of ways you can worship him and certain um, elements of those uh, of those acts of worship are mandatory and there are plenty of other ones which are uh, optional which you can um, add to your life and and ultimately build a beautiful lifestyle of worshiping the creator through so many different um, methods and ways of practice yeah you mentioned the optional um, worship and then so I think one of the things that um, causes doubts in people's mind is all of these things that I now have to do. For example, now I have to pray. I have to stop 
doing some things. Uh, I have to, you know, all of these restrictions. Um, how, 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 what is your advice to someone who has started, ha starts having these doubts when, they, when they're thinking about um, becoming a Muslim? Yeah, it can be really daunting sometimes, just the thought of like, okay, when I become Muslim, there's all these rules that like, I'm, you know, I'm not used to all these restrictions and, and you know, my lifestyle is the total opposite. Will I have to switch overnight or in a matter of weeks or months? And, you know, I guess the, the best advice you can give is to, you know, remind someone that it's a process, it's a journey. And, you know, we have people who are born Muslim their whole lives and they're still are in that journey of, of trying to unhealthy or wrong or sinful actions or environments as they can. So it's a process and a journey and God is most merciful and forgiving and you take it at your own pace, pace. What is, what's easy for you. You do as much of it as you um, achieving, you know, that, that area of you know, practice or abstinence. Um, but be, be kind, be kind to yourself is probably the biggest one. Uh, know that if your intention is there, that's what God accepts. So if there's, for example, you know, someone might love their, you know, their Friday nights out drinking and they're like, okay, hey, but I love, I also love the teachings of Islam and I want to become a Muslim. How can I stop these Friday nights drinking? Set the intention that ultimately I absolutely want to stop these Friday nights out once I become a Muslim. Um, how you navigate that week by week as it comes, you will be accountable to God for that. So again, be sincere in that journey um, and, and you just try your utmost best and that's all God accepts from us. Yeah. Okay, and so step number four is to keep good company. Yeah, this is really, really important. You know, you've got that saying of show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are or that you're the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. In the Islamic tradition, we have something where the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that he, he, you know, he related the environment or the people that you hang around with to the blacksmith or the per person who owns a perfume shop. You're going to take the traits and qualities of them so you know if you're someone who is seeking to be more faithful to god more moral uh, more spiritually focused you know to be in more you know devotion and obedience to god you've got to make sure you're around similar people because it's you know a massive a massive means of either strengthening you or weakening you and we all know ultimately know this this is why the concept of peer pressure is such a big thing and it's not just something that happens when you're young and in school it happens as adults too we fall into peer pressure and we take the traits of those we hang around with. So really important to keep good company. And sometimes that doesn't mean dropping old friends. It just means finding some new ones to spend a bit more of your time with until gradually you, um, you know, kind of change your circles over time. And has, uh, have you had any experience of, um, you know, people um, not being able to deal with, um, you know, what's happened with their lives and with their friends and um, trying to make new friends, trying to make new Muslim friends. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not going to downplay and say it's so easy once you, you know, you choose it's easy, you know, I'm going to paint it like it's this, um, a, you know, a path of rose petals. It, it, it will be challenging and you will be tested. And God says in the Quran that do you think you be left to say that you believe and you won't be tested? That he will test you in your but ultimately again that sincerity of your relationship with god the conviction on you being a grown adult making your own choices living the life that you choose to live and not caving into the expectations pressures disappointments uh, bullying of others who might not agree with your life choice so yeah, it will be difficult at times but you know if you can use the Islamic guidelines for you know how we interact with people, even with our um, with enemies or even with people who disagree with our stance on things or our life choices. There's etiquettes to that. There's wisdom in that. There's an ability to be emotionally, psychologically resilient so that you don't kind of lose yourself to those struggles and battles. Um, you know, there's a way to navigate through that. And again, keeping good company, having um, you know a good knowledge base. Um, looking after your you know your mental health and being supported is really really important through teachers and mentors yeah correct i think as you progress more you will you will start to um gain more um friends who are muslim and then you will you will um experience you know what islam is through those friends. absolutely yeah from strength to strength and remember it's like it's like an, yes it's an uphill journey like it's like a staircase but you know one step after the other like one challenging situation after the other and each 
each obstacle you overcome, you will build strength. And you remember that, you know, whenever, you know, a good way to see things as well is like whenever there's a hard situation in front of you, God never gives us more than we can bear is what we learn from the teachings of the Quran, as well as there's always a lesson in every situation. There's always a greater good and everything is from God's wisdom. It's a very big concept that we learn in Islam, um, you know, trusting in God and understanding God's decree that even hardships and hard times are part of his decree, but they're always for ultimately a greater good. There are lessons in it. There's strength to be gained from it. Um, it will help you to sort those around you who are sincere and who actually mean well from for you from those who maybe don't wish well for you and who do want to, you know, kind of break you down and not see you really um, thrive and prosper. Excellent. So step number four, number five is? Yeah, number five, beneficial influence. So again, look at the, the information uh, exposure that we have around us, right? Ad advertising, media, newspapers, social media, our smartphones. Um, we are bombarded with influence through, through you know, everything that we're exposed to, books, movies, all those sorts of things. Um, we need to really choose those wisely as opposed to just by default or as opposed to, oh, well, it's entertaining or it's my downtime. We should be making sure that what's coming up in our newsfeed or what it is that we're reading are things that are going to build us up, give us, um, you know, a higher vision or, uh, you know, knowing that we're here for a bigger purpose to not be distracted by, you know, non-beneficial information or information that causes doubt or speculation um, to really put your, you know, put in your way of influence, um, positive sources of, of learning and even um, entertainment or your downtime, right? Choosing what you even choosing what you watch what kind of movies or tv shows you you watch you have to choose them wisely they're shaping ultimately your mindset your identity your psyche whether you realize it or not these are all sources of influence uh, upon our identities that's right yeah and and the closer you want to get to god then you have to make what your uh, your environment is you have to make it in a something that god loves and so yeah, that, when, you, when you're in yeah. that environment then you will you get more chances to, be, to come closer to God. Or on the yeah. reverse, if you're going yep. into in bad influences and bad environments, then uh, you know, of course, uh, you're going to. It's going to be harder for you to to find. Exactly. For. Yeah, it's either calling you to God or away from God, and it's either strengthening your faith or weakening your faith. So you look at every situation, every you know, everything that you expose yourself to, or every even friendship or or, or an event or an outing is this. You know, is there something in this that's going to um, awaken, you know, my consciousness of God or is it something that's going to call me away from it? Okay, it's an interesting thing at the bottom here about music. So um, how, how, what will uh, someone who just converts to Islam, what, what will they have to do about their music? Yeah, so the music topic is something that people often struggle with. They're like, well, how? Like, music is my vibe. Like, that's what, you know, helps to pick up my mood. This is what, you know, I, I love my music, people will say. Um, you know, and again, we remind them, you know, that it's a process. It's a journey of now just trying to be more conscious. Like, okay, let's have a look. Let's look at some of the lyrics of some of the music. Let's, you know, let's really um, be critical of, for example, music clips, especially these days, like the modern pop music and some of the, um, the the type of music that young people are listening to is really really appropriate, um, and ultimately, you know, these types of things are again taking us away from the awareness of God, from being uh, moral people, from keeping our desires in check, from pe being people of higher vision. Um, again, music is a big influence to that. It, it changes your mood. So if, if if listening to music can change and switch your mood and what you're thinking and feeling then it's not you who's in control, right? So you want to be someone who is in control of your thoughts and emotions as opposed to someone who is easily hijacked by uh, you know, what they're exposed to. And if, if there's um, someone who wants to be a Muslim, but they, they don't want to stop their, they don't want to stop alcohol and they don't want to stop their music, um, what do you suggest for them? I suggest for them to still enter, enter into Islam, be sincere in you know, wanting to get closer to God, and ask God, pray to God and say, God, if these things, um, if I, you know, if these things aren't good for me, I trust that you say they're not good for me. Give me the strength to live them for your sake. And God willing, he will give you the strength. 
even though there are things that you do or that you like and you cannot imagine being able to have the strength to stop them, ask God, turn to him. He's the all powerful and he can change, um, change our hearts from what we think we love to it becoming something that we're not interested in at all that we that we despise yeah that's 100 percent correct so what i experienced in my conversion was that um uh i just I, I thought i decided that um you know i started to realize that other things were more important than others and the priority of music every every day came lower and lower because the love that i was getting from seeking knowledge of islam or praying to allah or meditation and this sort of thing the priority of that became so much higher and I didn't care about the music anymore. I still love music, yep. but um, other things yeah. became more important. As yeah, I, it gets as bumped I right down. Yeah, it got bumped right down where it's almost irrelevant now, yeah. you know, so that's the goal. Yeah. And, and now I, I enjoy the Islamic music. You know, they have uh, beautiful singing. They have some drums yeah. accompanied to it. And yep. um, I get my um, music uh, thrill. Uh, the, what I'm seeking from music, I get, I can get it from the, from the yeah. music. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at. So step six is giving back. Um, you know, one of the greatest ways to to feel fulfilled and contented in life is to give others what you either wish you had or what you've been blessed to have. Um, and you know, part of your faith and identity being improved is being able to help others with theirs. And for me personally, that's basically why I do what I do. It's what helps to keep me on track, reminding others about the creator, reminding others about the blessing of Islam. I only have very basic knowledge, um, you know, thanks to God. But, um, I, you know, when I teach and remind others or I'm able to speak to others or support others, it reminds me, it reminds me, helps me really more than perhaps the person. So, you know, if, if others are involved in giving back and um, you know, sharing with others little things that they've learnt, uh, teaching someone, you know, a little a supplication or a part of the prayer or um, helping in the charity project that, you know, with something that they perhaps struggled with at some stage in their life. This is what can really help to build your sense of faith and pride in your identity. Like, wow, this is what our faith teaches us to do and reminding others about it. It will just help to do that for you yourself. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, this is what I also experienced was that interacting with the Muslims, I, I noticed how they are always trying to help you or to do something good for you. And just by yeah. by interacting with this, you start to do it. And then when you start to do it, yep. you feel the benefit of it, and it's something that you start you, you want to do all the time. And it's um, yeah, exactly. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, uh, God Almighty says in the Quran, He says, "Hal jazaul ihsani illa ihsan Is there any other reward for good except more good? Like, just share the goodness, spread the goodness. And Islam is such a, a faith of service and giving and contribution. And you know, the researchers on which religious community you know are the most charitable. And Alhamdulillah, Muslims are right there at the forefront. It's part of our tradition that we are people who are always giving and sharing and being hospitable and helping others. And, uh, you know, if, if that's the, the physical practice of Islam, the teachings of Islam, and we worship God through those acts of service, what an amazing way to be able to boost our, our faith through that. Yeah. yeah. And there's also been uh, scientific research about people who are sick or depressed or something. And if they go out and try and do something for someone else, this yep. sickness or the psychological problem, it, it, it decreases or goes away. It's, a, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's an amazing way to uh, address issues like depression and, um, yeah, having, having conditions like that. Okay, step seven, read, read, read. Yeah, step seven, the first commandment, you know, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the cave of Hira through the angel Gabriel, when he was, you know, first given words from the Quran through the angel Gabriel. It was Iqra, read. And, you know, we Muslims, this, is, this should be part of our, our tradition for how we learn. Um, it is through, through reading. And whether you're reading the Quran or reading books or reading articles, it's, it's so important that we are people who are attached to the written text. Now we're living in times where people are, we're all, we're all consuming visual content. It's all videos. It's all... Uh, flicking, flickering images it's an image-based generation of learning that we have now unfortunately but we have to stay tied to the tradition of being a text-based uh, you know uh, people because this is where true knowledge and wisdom 
pen and he commanded it to write and he, everything that would just that being in our that is in our story that that's from the start of creation to the first revelation to the prophet muhammad is knowledge and learning and so we should be so hungry and thirsty for that and, and using a lot of our time for that and dedicating our time for that we can't grow in faith unless we know um and we can't know unless we're reading for someone um interested in becoming muslim what, what sort of things they should should they read and where will they get it yeah, so we'd always say to read the Quran, an English translation of the Quran, and you can access them pretty much from anywhere in the world. Um, you can just, for example, Google the word free Quran and somewhere local to you or even overseas will find a way to send you one. If you can't, you can always get online versions, PDFs, apps, um, there's access to it. Um, so yeah, definitely to read the Quran, to read literature, which is based on introducing Islam to you in a way that is uh, easy to read, easy to digest, understanding what the five pillars of faith are, understanding what the six articles of the Islamic belief are, and um, you know, learning a little bit about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his life, because you know, part of being a Muslim is tes the testimony of faith, which is to believe that God is the only one worthy of worship, and that the Prophet Muhammad is his final slave and messenger. And a lot of people um, often they're like, yeah, I know God, I believe in God and his oneness, but I'm not sure about the Prophet Muhammad, I need to learn about him first. So I'd encourage people to get literature or you can watch a lot of um, different things online. Go to a reliable website such as your website, eh, brother? And, um, uh, yeah, just start start uh, investigating. Yeah, uh, the website we have is called uh, ontoislam.com and uh, there's just a few articles there about um, convert, converting to Islam and so forth. So you can check that out. Yeah. Uh, step eight is finding decent role models we talked about earlier. Yeah, definitely. Finding decent role models or even finding mentors. Um, as you can see on the page, that's estimated that up to 95% of human behavior is learnt by looking up to role models. So it's really important to have individuals that you meet along the way that you see yourself in them, so that potentially you're like, I could be like that person one day. And what that does is it instills within you a sense of, of hope and self-belief that if you have conviction, you know, in the journey or the path that you're upon, that you're able to then believe in yourself enough to carry yourself through the, the tests, the trials and the hard times. Um, also, you know, finding decent role models is also about learning about Muslims from the past, learning about the lives of the different prophets who are the, the best lived example of being faithful to God. Um, again, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he exemplified how to live the Islamic teachings, the morals, the state of heart, the humanity, the character, when you see his life and you see how he was as a human being, you realize like that is the potential for, you know, the, the quality of person that you can become if you live according to God's guidelines, which we know as the Quran and the Sunnah, the Sunnah being the, the, the practice, the speech, the behaviors and approvals of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yeah, the way I learned the most um, in my experience was to actually um, learn face to face with someone. You know, like there's, there's only a certain amount you can read from a book. You can get a lot of uh, knowledge from a book, but there's some things that you can't get from a book. You know, for example, trying yeah. to imitate the way someone is. If you look at, you're, you're talking to someone and you can see that they truly love something, right? So in our case, they truly love God. And you, by just seeing that love and the way they are, you will, uh, something in you will try and copy that and you will try yeah. and be, be like that person. So these um, role models is very important if you want to, you know, exactly. if you want to get closer yeah. to God. Definitely. And I think we need more role models in our communities. We need more lived examples. And that was part of why I stepped into the work that I do and, uh, and I'm a bit more public and outspoken within the work that I do previously. I was never online. You would never be able to find a photo or video of me. And I, I wish I could still have that, you know, but I realize the times we're in now, if we don't have more, visible public figures especially role models for muslim women and, and young girls um we can't and how can we complain about them following uh incorrect role models when we aren't putting out uh, positive role models for our girls and our women to learn from or to see as a living example of you know i wouldn't mind to to become someone like that or to have knowledge like that or to to speak about islam like that or do those types of um community projects so um yeah, it's really important that we do have role models.
Yeah. And now that we have the internet, uh, only yesterday I was speaking to a brother, Saeed from uh, US, um, from Kansas. And he told me his story. He, he, he converted to Islam. There used to be Muslims in the city. And then three years ago, they all left for some reason. The, the mosque mm -hmm. closed and they all left. So, you know, now what does he have to do? He has to virtually connect with Muslims over the internet. Uh, so oh, he wow. uses Facebook and this sort of thing. So yeah, yeah his story was quite amazing. But um, yeah, so these role models, if you can't find them in your locality, then you have yep. to search for them online. Yeah, and, um, exactly. Uh, and you can find them online. You can find that that connection um, in, in the digital world as well. Some of my, my favorite mentors who I've been able to connect with and learn from are women who live halfway across the world, like the... The world is small now, you know, because of the World Wide Web. So there aren't any excuses to say, I don't, I can't find anyone to support me or I don't have anyone to look up to. You just need to um, look and, you know, within time you'll find someone. Yeah, 100%. Okay, step nine. Yeah, step nine is to have honour. And um, I'm someone that tries to remind people about the importance of values. And I do a lot of workshops and programs where I introduce the concept of people really looking at what their values are and something that's missing that is impacting the state of faith and identity within our Muslim communities globally is we don't feel honor in being Muslim. We don't carry enough honor and pride in uh, knowing who God is in the fact we have the Quran, which is a heavenly book here on earth. Like we don't have honor in that. We have guidelines and, and, and a way to live our life. We have a formula for the ultimate um, journey of success in this life and the next and um, you know I always just try to remind people about uh, have dignity and honor in being Muslim and I remind them of that through different verses of the Quran where God says that he you know honored um, mankind the son of Adam just the fact that we're human beings is a source of honor and then being you know uh, and then being uh, God mentioning that we're the Khalifa we're the vicegerents the caretakers the leaders on earth Again, we have so much honor by default that we're born with, but we need to be reminded of that to start to feel it and identify with it so that then we can march forward with actually practicing our faith and standing um, true to our, our practices and our, our, our religious teachings and principles. Um, because if we carry, if we have the faith, but then we have shame because the world is saying this or that about Muslims or people call us names when we go out into the street, we're going to have this inner conflict. So we're going to have, you know, the seed of faith within our hearts, but then we are what's, you know, what's called, I teach a lot about it too, the internalized depression, where you now you start to agree with what your oppressors are saying about you. You start to feel ashamed and embarrassed about being Muslim, about praying in public, about wearing the hijab, about having a beard, about um, not shaking hands or about wearing modest clothing. You start to feel embarrassed to be different. And, um, you know, it's really important to be reminded, like, have honour, live with honour and don't be shy or ashamed of what you've been blessed with by God in the Islamic faith and teachings and in being a human, you know, a high quality human being at the end of the day. That's all we want to aspire to be. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, this is how I felt as well, that any time there was a test in front of me, that God put there, that I had to make a decision. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever I chose the choice, which was to do it for God, then suddenly it just all became easier. And, yeah. um, you know, some of those things that you were talking about um, and having to, you know, not worry about other people and just, you know, have honor in yourself and your religion and your God. Uh, this is truly yeah. important. Okay, yeah. number 10, don't compromise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, number 10 is don't compromise. Like, don't compromise your principles. Don't compromise your faith. Don't compromise your identity. Like, be true to yourself, which is ultimately, hopefully, you're being true to your creator and, and what he expects from you. And there's nothing that God calls to or that he, he forbids that is ultimately bad for us or bad for humankind or bad for this, this world or this planet. So we need to have, again, the honor, the conviction in what it is that we believe in and stand for. And don't compromise, don't bend, don't change because of the judgment or the, the you know, the hardship or the, the pressure that's put on you by those around you. So, again, just to have a strong sense of resolve to um, give up on the truth that you have found um, and not to let what we know is Shaitan or the devil and his whispers to create um, uh, you know, doubt within you, self-doubt is a big one, or death or the value 
of the the Islamic teachings, um, and yeah, just just don't compromise. Like, don't give up on 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 what you are ultimately aiming for, despite the struggles that might come your way. Okay, you mentioned the devil. So, what is the Islamic perspective of the devil, and how how does it affect us? And you know, uh, what should we know about this? Yeah, so we believe in the concept of the devil and that ultimately, originally, he was um, a worshipper of God from the, he wasn't an angel, he was what was we know as the jinn, which is um, a, a being or a creation made from a smokeless uh, flame. And, um, you know, he were, when God created Adam, um, the, the devil, we know he was named Iblis, was jealous of the creation of Adam and and upset by the fact that God commanded the angels and and Iblis to bow to Adam because this was now a superior creation who was going to be again the vicegerent the leader on earth and um, and you know since that time because of that jealousy um, Satan refused to bow to Adam and made an oath to God that he was going to mislead mankind from the path of truth. Why? It's pure, out of pure jealousy that he wants to try to, to show God that, see, the human beings are, are not superior, you know, and try to make it that he is superior. So the battle um, ensued from then and God gave him respite until the day of judgment and human beings are on earth until the day of judgment. So there is a battle there and we believe the devil is a, an unseen creation, but he comes to the hearts and he just whispers. The only power ability he has is to whisper suggestion to cause us to... Um, fall from the path of being true and obedient to the creator. So we just try to be aware that any evil inclinations that we might have or suggestions that they are from the devil and his plot and plan to take us off the path of uh, being, uh, you know, fulfilling our purpose successfully. Okay. So it says uh, shine bright. That's the end of the PDF. So this is probably <laughs> yeah. a good idea for um, anyone interested, even for Muslims to download this PDF. And it's a good reminder for, for you. Um, yeah, it's a little light read, but um, you're good to have conversations about it or to just reflect on it in your own life and journey. Okay, so we'll have to um, wrap it up here. Um, can, you, can you give us your final advice to anyone who's um, thinking about accepting Islam and becoming Muslim um, on um, what, what should they do or any, just any advice you have for them? Continue learning or if you haven't started learning, start learning. Uh, make sure that the sources of your learning are, it's very, very important to know the sources of your learning are authentic. So get advice in that. Um, you could contact uh, Brother Adi or myself and, and ask what are some good sources of, of learning or some good websites because there is a lot of, as we would expect, dodgy websites out there and um, uh, falsely made literature to try to, um, you know, distort the actual truth and message of Islam. So just be aware of that. So start learning. Um, second thing I'd say is to get some support. So to find some Muslims who have some, uh, number one, very good character and who also have some knowledge to be able to gently guide you as you are involved in your learning or to direct you towards uh, Islamic teachers or scholars that might live in your local community that you can continue or start to learn from. Often a lot of major cities around the world will have intro to Islam type classes or, you know, um, basics of Islam type classes so it's always good to start learning um, and being supported in that learning journey and number three I'd say most importantly is if you're considering or you're, you're on the fence about um, you know becoming a Muslim to ask God sincerely to guide you to the truth if you are sincere in that like oh God guide me to the truth of who you are about my life about you know guide me to the the true faith which is going to be most pleasing to you and lead to my success in this life and the next. Just ask God for that, right? And um, if it's, it's, it's Islam for you, then God will guide you to that. For us as Muslims, we believe that it is the answer and that it is the ultimate truth. But, you know, for you who is feeling unsure, just be sincere in asking God, guide me to what is true about my existence, uh, about who you are um, and to a way of life that is, you know, most pleasing and, and um, the best for me, and then, um, yeah, hopefully God will, will make things easy for you in your journey ahead. Yes, yes, I hope so too. Um, okay, Kalisha, thank you for joining us.
No problem. Thanks for joining us on the show. And what, so what's the best way for anyone to contact you if they want to? Um, yeah, so feel free to just find me uh, on the social, different social media platforms. Just look for Kalisha Bennett, or you can also email me, Kalisha at developingdiamonds.com.au. Um, but yeah, pretty much easy to find and easy to contact. And I haven't seen someone um, with the same name yet. So um, yeah, just, just look us up and um, reach out if there's any way that we can support you. Or help, or help you in your learning journey. We've got lots of uh, you know, free content, free online courses as well on the introductions to Islam. Uh, you're more than welcome to um, benefit from some of what we have to offer. Okay, Kalisha, once again, thanks for joining us. And no hopefully um, so in the future, you can come on again and, and talk again. Absolutely. Um, so um, may peace be upon you. And also you to all our listeners, peace be upon you too. Yeah, peace be upon you all and thank you so much for having me on the podcast.